Thank you all so much for coming to this event. Um, I'm very excited um, to be moderating this panel of such a group of um, you know, esteemed uh, panelists with a great set of perspectives on oversight and surveillance, which will be um, the main topic that we'll be talking about today. Um, so for our panelists, we have uh, just going across Sharon Bedford Franklin, who is the Director of Surveillance and Cybersecurity Policy at New America's Open Technology Institute and has a fantastic new report that I'm sure she'll be happy to talk about. Andreas Pescum is a member of Tech Congress. He has served in multiple congressional offices in that capacity, providing tech expertise to them. And Nassim Moshiri is the Policy Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of DC. Um, so just to um, dive right in, um, Andres, could you talk a little bit about your role um, and you know what uh, it, your experience, you know how that relates to surveillance and oversight of surveillance activities? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I uh, am Andres. I'm manager, program manager at Tech Congress. Um, just a little bit about Tech Congress. We place technologists in cap on Capitol Hill um, in committees and in personal offices uh, to provide in-house technical expertise to members of Congress. Um, the idea behind Tech Congress uh, came because of our founder, who was uh, a staffer in the Energy and Commerce Committee during the, um, the, the drafting of Obamacare. And he realized that the Robert Wood Johnson's fellows, which are physicians that are placed in Congress, provided critical insight into the drafting of that legislation and thought, you know, why don't we have this for technical expertise? And as a congressional staffer, before I joined Tech Congress, uh, who worked on tech policy issues and who has no technical background, I often would outsource my, uh, my understanding of technical issues uh, to really any interested party. Um, and that would show up in the policy that, um, that I advised my boss on. Um, and that's good and bad to have that kind of perspective. But to have it in-house, um, I think, is something that you know, we fully support and actually improves how um, how members uh, how members do any kind of tech policy or, or legislate in that in that space? Um, so I guess a couple things I, in terms of oversight of surveillance. What we've <laughs> I don't know that I can I, I can actually speak on that, um, but I will say that something that all of our fellows who uh, we've now we're now at number twelve and we will have eight more coming in twenty nineteen. Um, have hit the ground running whenever they join into a congressional office. There's something about technical expertise and oversight that, that just kind of um, mends really well for them. Um, and they're able to, and they have a sp special insight into uh, technology that is not currently present on Capitol Hill. And they have, because of that, they have this, um, I don't know if I can say this, but a polite bullshit detector um, when, they're, when they're investigating. Um, and that's something that I think is really helpful. The, impetus for Tech Congress is like became perfectly obvious in the uh, Zuckerberg hearings. Um, I think just noticing how many senators were unable to grasp maybe the business model of tech of uh, Facebook or you know what actually had happened that was so egregious um, kind of left a gap in the oversight that could have been conducted throughout that hearing and even before and after it. Um, so that would be the reasoning why I think tech literacy is actually really important. Um, for Congress to improve, um, and why Tech Congress will continue to have a presence uh, on the Hill. Right. So, um, you know, obviously, Tech Congress is providing a lot of help to the offices where you have individuals. As you said, you know, there's a limited number of people and a limited number of places where you can make that influence. Um, and as you said, at the Facebook hearing, you know, there was a lot of blowback about that for some members who seemed um, not quite to have the best understanding of how one of the largest companies in uh, the United States worked and how it should be regulated. That blowback maybe caused some to take stock of we need to understand this better, some did not. So how, how can we make tech literacy a greater priority for all the members of Congress? How can we you know, get across the board the motivation for them to say we need to you know, get better at understanding this stuff and take it uh, with you know, a more urgency that it needs? So I think. Um one, the Facebook hearing put that on full display. But um, two, I think congressional offices are really starting to grasp the necessity of having technical expertise in their offices. When our fellows go and do their informational interviews when they're deciding which office they'd like to go to, um, one common theme is that offices recognize that 
tech has now permeated into every other issue. It's not in itself a, uh, a distinct issue area. Like it used to be, it used to get grouped in with telecom, usually the staffer was a telecom tech staffer. And now technology, you know, is involved in like the ag committee and how drones are used to, to um, help produce uh, crops for the United States or, you know, transportation and how technology is used and positive train control to pr prevent accidents. Um, so this is, I mean, like, it's literally everywhere, and I think offices are aware of that. Uh, Tech Congress doesn't have the capacity to put a technologist in every congressional office, and that's definitely not our goal either. Our goal is actually to, by placing a technologist in, in an office, to prove the value of having that expertise, and then to incentivize offices to hire for it on their own. And that has been the case for two of our fellows who decided to stay on, Chris Sugoyan, who now is senior technologist for Senator Ron Wyden, and Sunman Kim, who is senior policy advisor for tech issues uh, for Senator Brian Schatz. And you know, we hope to have many more fellows get hired on after their experience. Um, and eventually, Tech Congress will become, in the ideal world, irrelevant, because offices will be putting out um, uh, postings for technologists in this committee, technologists in this uh, particular office. Great. Um, Taryn, do you want to talk a little bit about your role? Sure. So um, I am now with uh, New America's Open Technology Institute, uh, which is a think tank and advocacy organization and work on a variety of issues related to privacy and technology, law and policy, including government access to data and um, surveillance and a host of other issues. Um, just before coming to New America, I was um, executive director at the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the P Club, it is an independent agency within the executive branch whose mission is to review counterterrorism programs to ensure that they have adequate safeguards for privacy and civil liberties. Um, and it uh, recently just got a new quorum, um, but uh, I, I uh, had worked there for some time. Um, so, you know, looking at whether it's P Club or IGs or oversight bodies, how can um, civil society groups work with those types of organizations to promote robust oversight of surveillance to a more effective degree? Great. So um, Jake alluded to a report that uh, just completed working with a colleague over in the UK, which is looking at, and, and I have worked in, in both worlds, both the civil society uh, advocacy community before going to PCLOB and, and now again, as well as working for an oversight body. And we looked at ways in which civil society organizations can work in partnership or engage with oversight bodies to promote robust oversight or surveillance. Um, at a high level, the goals of both are the same, to make sure that surveillance is conducted in accordance with the rule of law and with respect for human rights. And we explored many ways in which um, there has been engagement between those communities, what can be productive there, what are barriers there, and um, strategies for making that a more productive engagement. Um, by way of example, uh, you know, in, in many cases, civil society organizations can sort of be the staff to the staff of the oversight bodies and help them expand bandwidth when they're uh, understaffed um, and doing research and white papers and so forth. Another theme there, um, picking up on what Andres was talking about, is in the technology area. So it is critically important that oversight bodies not simply rely on the technologists within the agencies that they oversee. Um, those agencies do have brilliant technologists who do a lot of work, but in the oversight capacity, it needs to be independent as well. Um, many oversight bodies um, don't have that technical staff, not just Congress, but other oversight bodies. And of course, we looked at other countries as well, and that's you know, a problem there as well. And there is a barrier. We looked at barriers to engagement generally. A critical barrier, of course, is classified information. There's a certain amount, you know, the, the sources and methods and the specific facts uh, related to particular programs and when the oversight body will be looking at them obviously need to remain classified. But there are ways to overcome that barrier in particular, even with regard to technologists, that we uh, felt that there's more ground for more 
more ways in which oversight staff can reach out even to technologists in civil society who have a lot of knowledge about how technologies work and if the conversation is brought to a sufficiently high level of generality about capabilities, they really can be helpful making sure the oversight bodies know what questions to ask even though the um, outside technologists may not be able to have access to and have the conversation at that fully granular level. Also looking forward, there are issues that are, we're expecting to come up with artificial intelligence, which is a tool in so many spheres now. And there's a lot of academic work being done um, by civil society and, and, other, and academic te uh, technologists that can be drawn upon uh, by oversight bodies as well, looking for how to structure those systems. So uh, we hope we made some recommendations for how that engagement can move forward to really um, enhance the goals of both uh, civil society and oversight bodies for robust oversight. Great, thank you. Um, Nassim, do you want to talk a little about your work? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Nassim. I'm policy director at the ACLU DC. Um, and as the local affiliate of the ACLU, our work uh, is focused on defending and furthering the civil liberties and civil rights of everyone who lives in, works in, or visits the district. Um, we do our work through litigation, of course, uh, through legislative advocacy uh, before the DC Council, which is my role, and also through uh, public education outreach efforts. Um, and I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about local oversight um, of surveillance technology, and specifically the Community Control Over Police Surveillance, or CCOPS, campaign. Um, the objective of which is to empower local communities through their city councils to actually uh, be the decision makers about whether their local law enforcement agencies uh, should acquire um, and use um, and, and to place limitations on that use uh, different surveillance technologies. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of context for why the CCOPS campaign exists. Um, and, and you know, for folks, just in case you don't, you don't know a lot about how much surveillance technology local law enforcement uh, agencies have, but for the past two decades, um, local police departments have been acquiring um, increasing numbers of different surveillance technologies. And they've been doing this in secret, um, unilaterally, without any public input, um, and, and that includes um, no input or notice to elected officials um, in those cities, so just the agencies themselves. Um, often they're doing this uh, through federal grants um, that are provided by agencies like the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Justice. Um, they're purchasing this technology from private companies that deal in military weapons and surveillance uh, technologies. And in addition to acquiring the technology in secret, they're of course then using it um, in secret um, without any community control, um, which is where we get the name for the campaign, and, and without any public oversight. Um, and you know, of course this poses significant risks uh, to communities, uh, especially uh, threats to civil rights and civil liberties. And at the highest uh, risk are those communities that we know are already the targets of police surveillance. Um, so that's communities of color, Muslim communities, immigrant communities, low income communities, and groups that are very politically active are at the highest risk of having their rights violated. Although of course all of us are at risk when we don't know what sorts of surveillance are being used in our community and, and how, and, and the breadth of that surveillance. Um, and so it's against this backdrop that the community uh, control, I'm gonna say CCOPS, that the CCOPS <laughs> campaign was launched in 2016. Um, and uh, what it has led to is uh, local laws passed um, that require police departments to obtain approval before they acquire or purchase surveillance technology and before they use that technology from their city councils. And how that would work is in a process where they, um, they present a proposal to the city council and say we want to acquire this technology, this is why we want to acquire it, this is how we're going to use it. These are some of the things we're thinking about in terms of safeguarding people's rights and making sure we're not doing anything we shouldn't be doing. Um, and then there's a public hearing and the community gets to come to that hearing and testify before their city council and give their opinions. And so it really allows for the public and city councils to weigh the benefits against the potential harms and, and make that decision instead of just leaving that decision 
to the police department and, and also having them do it in secret so that we don't even know. Um, it's the, the CCOPS campaign is not necessarily about stopping police departments from acquiring or using surveillance technology. It's really more of a good government uh, transparency measure um, to, to bring that out of the shadows and, and let communities make those decisions. Um, in addition to the, to, to the obvious threats to civil rights and civil liberties, um, these technologies come at great cost. And so this is taxpayer money that uh, sometimes that the police departments are spending that maybe communities or public officials would decide could be better used on other community needs if they were able to make those decisions. And um, I'll just finish this intro up um, by saying that so far, nine jurisdictions have passed uh, CCOPS laws. Um, and in DC, we are hoping to be next. Um, we haven't launched a campaign yet, but we're having a planning meeting soon. And so if you're in the room and you work locally and you're interested in joining us for our campaign, um, please come and talk to me after the panel. Thank you. So what, um, in terms of the harm that this type of sort of um, surveillance first ask permission or don't ask permission, just say that we're doing it later um, approaches happening, um, both in tar the harms of surveillance and I imagine just the chilling harms of kind of having that panopticon of not even knowing when you're being surveilled or what surveillance exists. What, what type of tech poses the greatest harm and risk? Um, I don't know if I have an answer for what causes the greatest. I can give some examples of technology that we know um, police departments have, and, and we know that the Metropolitan Police Department has. Um, one is cell site simulators or stingrays, which um, you may already know about, that there's been a lot in, in, in the news over the past few years about those. Um, but if you don't, how they work is essentially um, they mimic cell phone towers. And so when they're in an, an, an area, they send out a signal and all of the phones that are within the radius of the stingray then ping back to the stingray because they're confused. They think that that's the cell tower. And in doing so, they reveal both the identity um, of, of the owner of the phone and the location of the phone. Um, and, uh, and, and in addition to that, they can also reveal any texts or emails that the person who has the phone is sending and that those can be intercepted as well. Um, and uh, one thing to note about stingrays is that they can't be targeted. So for example, if a police department is using a stingray because they're looking for a specific suspect and they think he's gonna be in a neighborhood, they're like, we're gonna locate his phone. We're gonna locate him through his phone. Um, they can't just target that suspect, right? So if they're in an area, it's gathering the information of everyone who's in that area. Um, and what happens to that data, um, and, and, uh, and you know, of course, um, any messages or anything like that that people are sending, that is all um, very dangerous and um, could, you know, it, it's really a tool for mass surveillance. So, so that's one example of surveillance technology that we know police departments have. Um, and I want to just give a quick example from Baltimore. Um, uh, the, the Baltimore Sun revealed, they, they did an investigation a few years ago, and they revealed that the Baltimore Police Department was using um, Stingray technology and that they had a non-disclosure agreement with the federal government. And so they weren't letting anyone know that they were using it. Um, and, uh, and not only were they using it, but they were predominantly using it not to stop terrorism, not, not to fight terrorism, which is the, the reason for, national security reasons are the reason for why a lot of police departments are acquiring the technology or the, their stated reasons, but they were really using it to police um, predominantly black communities, low-income communities in Baltimore for things like petty crimes, and they were also using it to track down protests like um, the, the, the Freddie Gray protests, they're, they're, they're using it to track down protesters. So there's a lot of dangers, chilling of speech and violations of privacy in, in the use of something like Stingray technology. Another quick quicker example I'll give is um, automatic license plate readers, which we all know about um, because they catch us speeding or <laughs> we use them when we drive through tolls. Um, and they're not necessarily a, ba a bad technology. They, they have good uses, right? They, they make it more efficient to drive through tolls um, and things like that and, and can make it more efficient to, to give speeding tickets. You might think that's good or bad. Um, <laughs> but what they also do is, that, you know, the, the way they work is that they capture your uh, license, uh, license plate information and they digitize it so that they can run it across databases. Um, and, and so the, the danger of that is that what they can do is they can really track 
where you're going all day. So they, they can find out, you know, just, just through tracking um, the, the automatic license plate readers, the, from the data, you can find out what uh, religious institutions someone goes to, what doctors they see, you know, where they're going, and they can really be used as a surveillance tool that way. Another danger is that a lot of private companies will give local jurisdictions this technology for free and say, in exchange, all we want is the data. Um, and then, you know, they could use that data for nefarious purposes. Um, one, one thing that we have seen is uh, private companies can, will then use that data, um, aggregate it or, uh, you know, separate the data and then give it back to police departments and allow them to track down for low income people who have maybe not paid like a speeding t ticket or traffic ticket and just stop them when they're on the way to the grocery store um, and, and tell them they have to pay the ticket then or they can be arrested. Um, another, another danger is that in Oakland, California, which is a sanctuary city, so that means their local law enforcement is not supposed to enforce immigration laws, um, they found out that their, the data from their um, ALPRs was going to a fusion center um, where data is shared among law enforcement agencies, and ICE also had um, access to that data from the Fusion Center, and so was using it to track down and target undocumented residents in Oakland. Um, and since then, Oakland has passed a CCOPS law um, once this was revealed. So those are two examples. We have a lot more examples on the ACLU website that you can read about. And there's also a lot of great reports, including one on um, automated license plate readers that I referred to very, very often by ACLU, so just a plug for that, yeah. A lot of great research and a lot of very scary tech. Um, so I want to start with a question that I think you guys will all have um, different but very informative perspectives on, which is, should Congress be more concerned with um, surveillance occurring at the state and local level? So I'll, I'll go first on that. So um, you know the initiative that Nassim was just describing is for the local control, um, but she mentioned at the outset that some of the efforts that have been going forward have been um, using federal funds to purchase tools, and then there's no oversight. So what Congress can do is provide more strings when those federal funds are issued. Um, there was a campaign a number of years ago that I was involved in where Department of Homeland Security was funding, uh, this was shortly after 9-11, uh, making grants available, including for uh, what we call, still call CCTV cameras or public video surveillance cameras are just mounted on the streets. And at first there were really almost no strings. Get your money, put up your cameras, you know, go at it. Um, they later started requiring at a minimum that a jurisdiction would adopt a privacy policy that would cover certain things about how they handle the data and data retention and so forth. So there's a lot more ground there for when these federal grants are made for the surveillance tech to put those requirements in and then that is a tool for oversight to make sure that as they're spent it's not just uh, waste, fraud and abuse but also uh, potential violations of people's rights and making sure that there are those uh, restrictions in place. Yeah, I would just say this is slightly outside of my wheelhouse and um, a little more policy oriented than Tech Congress would like to get involved in since we are a nonpartisan organization. But um, Congress, I will say that Congress does have the jurisdictional capabilities to conduct oversight over um, the usage of surveillance technologies at local and state levels, um, specifically the Intergovernmental Affairs Subcommittee on the House Oversight committee um, is ringing a bell for me, um, particularly if federal funds are used in the purchase of this, of that, of those technologies. Um, and even if not, I think the potential violation of any type of right would give Congress that, that ability to conduct that oversight. Do you, do you think that informative aid can trickle down? I mean, a lot of the time we, at the local level, we'll see instances where, you know, police departments will be handed things like um, stingrays like Nassim was talking about, other highly sophisticated surveillance tech. Um, and they will have trouble processing, you know, what bucket does this fall under in terms of surveillance laws and regulations? How secret do we have to be, you know, do, do these crazy non-disclosure agreements somehow trump FOIA and sunshine laws? You know, um, I mean, is, is there a role there? Do you think that Congress could, as they're doling out either the funds or the resources, like a loan a drone program to say, this is how this works and this is how it should be used? I, yes. I. I mean, I, <laughs> I think, yes, there is, there's definitely a role for Congress there. Um, I would place it, though, on the federal government um, 
you know, handing down these types of technologies and not properly instructing the um, local and state governments on how to use them. Mm -hmm. And th that to me seems like the, the bigger <laughs> issue um, uh, there, yeah. I, seem I don't know that I have too much more to add than, than Sharon said, but you know, do you, to the extent that Congress wants to be a check on executive power, um, and you know, the you know the executive has, um, like the, for, for example, President Trump has um, an, a certain agenda when it comes to uh, local uh, policing of communities, um, even on the local level, um, and so you know. Yes, Congress should have some sort of role in that. Um, in DC, we have a, a special relationship with Congress, um, so I don't, um, you know, I, I don't have a, a lot to say about that. So a, a common criticism that can come up in this space, you know, we hear, well, yes, Congress has funds; they can take them away. But, you know, members of Congress will say we don't want to be too prescriptive. You know, maybe maybe we shouldn't be funding this because of issues like race, fraud, and abuse because. Know, the technology isn't being used properly, but we don't want to set parameters on you. So, we'll, you know, what are some responses to that in terms of, um, you know, responsible use or properly limited use of these technologies for members that are worried about prescribing to states and localities? Well, I, I don't want to speak to that as a global question, but in the space of surveillance yes. technologies, um, you know, it, Congress uses the the, the funding power in all sorts of ways that is tied to things. I mean, that's how we got a, a drinking age of 21, because it was tied to the federal f highway funds. So here, where in the surveillance space, um, Congress is certainly well familiar with the balancing that needs to occur to make sure that law enforcement and our intelligence agencies have the tools that they need, but those also come with critical safeguards to make sure that we protect privacy and civil liberties, individual rights. So this is not unfamiliar territory um, uh, for Congress. I, mean, I mentioned the example of with DHS p requiring a privacy policy. They didn't at that time, and I haven't checked to see if it's gotten uh, if it's changed more recently. They didn't say, "Here's your privacy policy; you have to adopt." You know, they weren't getting down to that level of detail. But certain, but prescribing at a higher level certain safeguards that need to be in place. If we're giving you money for these powerful surveillance tools, seems uh, not only appropriate but uh, important. So, um, Chern, you, uh, as you said previously, worked on PCLOB. Um, you know, it's an organization that many in the civil liberties community have interacted a lot with that have gained a lot of knowledge from. And I assume you think that it's a, a good model to inform the public. Um, I mean, if so, do you think it could be a good model to inform the public about other surveillance issues? Um, you know, some of these kind of often um, shrouded in secret um, types of surveillance that Nassim was talking about. And if so, you know, what, what, what types of surveillance issues beyond PCLOB, which for those who don't know, um, is, is limited in its mandate to examining privacy and civil liberties in relation to counterterrorism. Well, beyond counterterrorism, might PCLOB be a, a good model for, for a similar type of, you know, PCLOB 2? Okay, so there's a little bit to unpack there. Um, so as Jake mentioned, um, the jurisdiction of uh, the PCLOB is limited to reviewing counterterrorism programs. So it's not everything that the intelligence agencies do, although then again, it's not limited to intelligence agencies because departments like Department of Homeland Security also operate uh, counterterrorism programs. In terms of its role in forming the public, um, I think that is a critical role that the PCLOB plays as an oversight body. The statute um, setting up the agency uh, specifies that the reports of the PCLOB need to be um, available to the public to the greatest extent possible, consistent with protection of uh, classified information. So it, it, they are instructed by Congress to you know, push that and make sure, obviously, you protect the classified information, but otherwise to really inform the public. That is one of the functions for which it was established. So I do think that's an important model. Um, if you're asking whether there had been some recommendations um, back in tw uh, 2013 and 2014 to expand the PCLAB's jurisdiction so it would cover everything that the intelligence agencies um, do, which is, you know, foreign intelligence information in other contexts. Um, if <laughs> someone wanted to go there, either with a, and add that jurisdiction to the PCLOB, I think there are other structural changes that would need to happen uh, to that agency. For example, the, the PCLOB right now uh, is headed by, it's headed by a five-member bipartisan board, all members appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. 
but only the chairman is full time. The other four members are part time, and most of them uh, have tended to hold other jobs. So if you're going to expand the jurisdiction, I think you need to make all of the members full time uh, and would need to uh, substantially expand it. Right now, the P Club is just come, just as of last month. Uh, the Senate confirmed uh, three new members, so the agency will now have a quorum again. It had a period of 21 months with sub quorum and wasn't operating at all. So right now, I think it needs to get back on its legs and hire more staff because of staff attrition as well uh, before anyone should consider expanding its jurisdiction. So we, we, we've talked a, a good bit about Congress and tech literacy, um, but I've seen you know, th this is something that can bubble out into a lot of other areas. You know, it's a problem we often see with um, local surveillance is that law enforcement will go to courts that simply don't understand the implication of what they're being asked to approve and will prove something much more expansive than they think they are. You have, um, you know, within agencies, um, oversight functions where they do not understand the implications of what's going on because of the technical ramifications. H how can we improve tech literacy in other areas of government beyond Congress, such as, you know, IG offices, the judiciary um, are the two that come to mind from what I've been talking about. But, you know, there are, there are obviously a wide array of areas where tech literacy could greatly aid effective policy and protection of um, our rights. Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can field that. Um, you know, during our application process, we often get a bunch of applicants that ask if there's other places they can go other than, you know, the federal legislative branch. You know, are there state uh, legislature options? Are there state AG options, state IG options for them to go and, and provide uh, tech expertise to them? And while we don't have the program yet, it's something that we're interested in expanding. Um, because of the interest there, uh, I would say that Code for America is probably the closest group right now that's doing something similar to that. Um, they're placing uh, eager public interest technologists into uh, local governments and state governments across the country. Um, and you know, at this point, it seems like it's more of a capacity issue rather than an actual interest issue. I would highly, highly encourage more technologists to get involved at the local and state level if they can um, through fellowships or even just through application um, because it clearly would improve the way the policy is, is implemented at that level. Um, uh, just to add to that, um, on the looking at the judiciary, um, particularly with regard to the FISA court, which is the court that you know reviews applications for uh, government surveillance conducted under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the USA Freedom Act that was enacted in 2015 included authorization for um, what were called, Amiki, uh, friends of the court, to, uh, panel of at least five people who would have security clearances, who can, in significant cases, um, be designated by one of the judges on the FISA court to come and provide an outside perspective. So the court isn't just the judge isn't hearing just from the government, and the Amiki can look to particularly safeguards for privacy and civil liberties and um, provide an additional perspective. That legislation also clarified that it's not just for lawyers, but could also be relied on for technical expertise. And um, at least as of a couple of years ago, I know um, when we were looking at that, when I was still at the P Club and we were looking at how that was being implemented, the FISA court indicated that they were interested in pursuing that uh, based on the public list of amici who have been approved. I don't think they've yet gone there, but I think that that is a, certainly an avenue where I would hope they would, so that they, that. The applications in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act often are going to involve highly technical issues. And so for that court to be able to rely on outside technical expertise beyond just the technologists who are at the agencies, I think, would be very, very helpful. And Nassim, you know, I, I'm very glad that we are reforming the FISA Accord and have advocates there, and hopefully we'll have more technologists. I mean, do you think on the more local level mm -hmm. for the issues you're talking about that if we had technologists that you know, magistrate courts, local courts, that that could make a big difference to the issues you've identified? I mean, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, it, in, in D.C., and, and I think also <coughs> just the the uh, CCOPS laws and the, the, the process to get to CCOPS laws will also help provide some education, um, maybe not to the technical level, um, that would be helpful for courts um, to have, but will kind of ex expose more people to um, what different technologies are and what they do and the ways in which they can be used. 
um, which um, I, th I think will go a long way, again, in, in being able to provide helpful oversight. Um, we haven't launched the DC campaign yet, so but, but that, that's already one of the challenges that we've identified is, okay, then who on the local level is knowledgeable enough to be able to explain this to the council, like uh, you know, someone who's outside of the police department so that they don't just rely on what the police department says they're using the technology for or what it, the technology does. Um, so going back to Congress, um, you know, one issue that comes across, obviously members of Congress, they, um, they deal with a very wide array of issues. They have limited time. They rely on, on staff a lot as a result of that. And one big wall for <coughs> staff providing effective um, advice and gathering information for themselves to make evaluations, especially in the surveillance space, is classification. Um, how, how can we deal with the sort of classification barrier to all members of Congress getting um, the most level of information and advice from the staff that they rely on to pro often provide the expertise that they can't personally take the time to dig into on every single issue. So, so I think I think this is an important issue. Um, to a large extent, um, based on uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, uh, in 1978 and the creation of the intelligence committees, we have set up a system where just the intelligence committees in the House and the Senate are responsible for digging in and reviewing what the intelligence agencies do. And they all have you know, staff who are specialized and who all hold clearances. Um, and so we do have that level of oversight. But there are many issues, particularly when Congress is debating what should be the scope of what is allowed under our law. So when we're reauthorizing Section 702 for, of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, for example, members of Congress need to have an understanding of what it is they are authorizing, what are the rules that are going to be operational. And unfortunately, the rules now in place in Congress don't allow um, members of Congress to have a member of their personal staff who can get a full TS SCI clearance. So that's a top secret also with the SCI. Those uh, individuals exist on the, the the intelligence committees and some other committees, armed services, and there are a handful on each of the judiciary committees of staff. But most members of Congress do not have um, that kind of direct relationship with a staff member who will have that full clearance. And while all members of Congress are able to see the highly classified information, the TSSCI information themselves, they have a lot of issues on their plate. And we know they have staff. They rely on their staff to really dig in and advise them. And so those members of Congress who do not sit on any of the committees where they would have that fully cleared staff really um, lack that window. And it is much, much harder for them to um, do that type of evaluation and have that full understanding. So obviously, um, staff members would need to pass. I mean, the, the, the executive branch has to conduct the uh, evaluation to make sure it's appropriate to grant that clearance. So I'm not saying that you know, they should be able to hire anybody and allow them to do that. But if they make an effort and want to hire a staff member who is capable of acquiring a clearance and passes those, um, those uh, tests and that review, that that member of Congress should be able to have that ability to rely on that kind of cleared staff person. Yeah, I, I would second everything you just said. I, I, having uh, worked in a personal office <laughs> and adjacent to a committee, the oversight committee, that that often had to deal with stuff that was above a clearance that I had, um, it is a it's a handicap, I think, when trying to when your boss ends up going, you know, and receiving a bunch of information that they can't discuss with you and that you can't really advise them on. Um, it's absolutely a handicap in being able to to properly advise your boss. Yeah. And, and this, I mean, this is a little different, but um, an argument that's been made um, against adopting CCOPS has been that uh, we can't reveal information about these technologies because we're putting that information into the, the hands of the bad guys if, if we do that. Um, but we know, one, in reality, we, we know, like the Baltimore example and many other examples where surveillance has really just been used to um, track Black Lives Matter activists or to surveil Muslim communities in New York, New Jersey, and Chicago, that the, the technology is not, one, being used for national security reasons all the time, and, and, and even when it is being used 
for national security reasons. Um, it's, it's not revealing anything, it's just violating people's rights. Um, and two, um, the scope of CCOPS laws don't, um, don't, don't go uh, deep enough into the details um, in a way that they would hinder law enforcement from doing their job. So it's very basic foundational information about generally this is the technology and generally this, this is how we're gonna use it and these are some safeguards we're gonna put in place. Um, so that, that's different, but it sort of comes up. And just to kind of you know, draw out, any, you know, so like as a hypothetical, let's say I'm a member of the House Intelligence Committee, not not a chair or anyone who oversees control of the staff, but just a member. I'm looking at you know an upcoming FISA reauthorization. I go into the SCIF. I read all the details of how this you know program like 702 works in terms of exactly what is occurring in terms of you know undersea cable scanning going into and out of the United States. What about collections exactly are picking up, how they're limited, how they're not, what the law is interpreted to do in terms of the programs there. And I have a very rudimentary understanding of what all that means as I'm looking at that in the SCIF, spending all evening, you know, perhaps, God forbid, even canceling a fundraiser so I could spend my time researching. And I come out and I want to know not only, okay, d is what I think I read what is right? And also, if I want to, you know, change that in a certain way, is are is this bill that I'm looking at going to do that? Is this other bill I'm going to looking at going to do that? What what can I do? Who can I go to? In that scenario. Well, your hypothetical, you are on the intelligence committee, so there you're probably well situated because you have the staff of the intelligence committee who is who are all cleared and. Um, the models are slightly different in how the House and the Senate um, operate. The Senate Intelligence Committee members can have their own designated person. The on the on HIPSI, the House side, it's more of a you know body of staff. Um, but you would have access to them. You could ask them the questions, and they would presumably reach out to the relevant intelligence agency to get you more information. Um, they would come in and, and brief you and so forth. The harder situation that I was talking about is where a member is not on one of those committees. And so, you know, they can't really directly task that staff. I mean, they could ask questions and funnel it through. And if they're willing to spend the time, could presumably they could sit in on the briefings themselves, but they don't have that relationship with a staff member to be able to delegate and, and someone that they necessarily would know and trust and understand. Yeah, I'll just uh, add that you know we have had fellows who, prior to, to joining Tech Congress, um, have acquired and maintained TSSCI clearance, and who have showed interest in wanting to work in um, either one of the intelligence committees, and for whatever reason have not been able to do so, um, despite you know having the necessary clearance to 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 do that work, um, and I would. I would task you know the intelligence committees with you know perhaps a little more transparency on how they are staffing, um, because it's not entirely clear that they have technologists on their staff mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so yeah, that's just an, an another <laughs> something else to add to that. Okay, I, I could ask questions all day, but um, I've been told I don't have the room all day, and also there are many people here I'm sure have very interesting questions. So. Um, like to turn over to our audience to uh, ask questions. Um, yeah, I guess let's just go across. Uh, gentleman right there, the uh, green uh, tag. Oh, this mic, this mic. Oh, yeah, it looks great. Like, well, we will have a mic going around. Yeah, this is work. Okay, yeah, jeez. Hi, um, I'm Jack Gillum. With I'm a reporter with ProPublica. Um, the thing that you said earlier, Jake, that really I think is is I think the heart of a lot of these of these sort of I guess unknown unknowns about technology being used in these communities, is the fact that a lot of these private companies that sell this, whether it's Harris Corp and Stingray, whether it's body cams, have uh, NDAs that that seem to supersede state public records laws. Um, you know that goes farther than you know a lot of states and the federal government that allow you to sort of redact you know, segregable material and then release everything else that's not. In this case, it goes far and beyond that. Beyond that. Um, the federal FOIA has its own issues with sources and methods under Exemption 7. I'm just wondering if there's any, 
it seems like what needs to be addressed here are fixes primarily at the state legislature or the DC Council in DC to expand the state public records laws to, I guess, obviate these NDAs and to allow at least even the most basic information about this technology being used. I'm just curious if any of you can speak to if that movement's been happening or if there's been any sort of uh, ways to get around that just so, you know, people like in the fourth state or just the public writ large beyond legislators can can know what's going on. Um, I don't know about any movement that's happening in, in DC um, to do that. Um, one thing about the, the CCOPS model bill, um, which you can find on the ACLU website, is it does consider that, and that, so that's one reason why um, one reason for CCOPS is so that um, police departments don't hide behind the non-disclosure agreements and say, oh, well, we, we can't reveal this because um, we have an NDA. Um, the, the model bill would require police departments to reveal every sort of surveillance technology um, that they're acquiring. And, and there's no grandfathering, and so um, technologies that police departments already have, when, when a jurisdiction adopts a CCOPS law, they also have to then go through the approval process before they can continue to use. So that's one way to kind of combat the, the NDA culture. Yeah, and I would just add on, uh, you could also just try to address it directly by limiting the use of NDAs in certain contexts rather than having to go through the public records law. So it was only four years ago that we learned that the CIA was hacking into the Senate committee that was investigating the CIA, that torture report, um, and actually uh, as you mentioned the SCIF, um, going into the infrastructure they provided for uh, the legislators to conduct oversight of the same place. It seems unfortunate but real that anytime you're investigating an intelligence service, they may well be watching everything you do. In fact, literally watching everything you do. Um, to what extent have you seen um, the different institutions we entrust with oversight, whether they're internal, like IGs, or they're external, um, like uh, Congress or other state legislatures start to like take actual um, specific infrastructure investments to insulate themselves against the very real risk of the watchers watching the watchers back. <laughs> and also, just um, uh, for anyone who has a question, could you please identify yourself? Um, Alex <laughs> so that, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, I have not seen. Um, any movement in that direction, at least from the Oversight Committee. And I think, and the House Oversight Committee, I, oh, when I was there, I, the, a lot of the communication we had in order to conduct oversight over agencies was with the IGs. And for the most part, the IGs are very successful in, in parsing out things that agencies may not want to come to light before Congress. Um, in terms of intelligence agencies, we didn't have the jurisdiction for that anyway. And even if we had, uh, subpoenaed anyone from an intelligence agency to come before oversight, they probably would not have complied um, and stated a, a litany of reasons why. Um, so I did, didn't answer your question, but I would say that it, there is still some functionality that works really well. I don't know if they're they're watching uh, the watchers. <laughs> is, is oversight committee at least using encrypted networks and not using I don't think that I am equipped to answer that question. So I can't answer it directly, but I can answer a little bit tangentially. Um, so I can't speak, you mentioned an example that's obviously very fraud and has a lot of uh, battle scars um, on, on Congress and CIA over that relationship. But when I was at the um, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which is an oversight body within the executive branch, I can tell you for one thing, we did not, and I don't know if this is, have the system, we have, you know, classified email systems that we could use and we could communicate with the agencies we were um, conducting oversight of. We c did not have, our classified system did not talk to the classified system at the intelligence committees. We could not transmit by email. Um, so those don't talk to each other, <laughs> whatever. But more to, more to the point of the issue you're addressing, 
I was there at the P Club as we were standing up this new independent agency that is tasked with conducting oversight. And totally fortuitously, it came online as a, you know, coming into existence with the chairman um, coming, being sworn into office literally four days before the first Snowden leaks. And so it stood up very quickly and thrust into the spotlight to look at the Section 250. 215 telephone records program and section 702, which were the subject of many of those leaks. And we did a lot of work to gain the trust, I hope, of <laughs> the intelligence agencies, of course this is all within the executive branch, but still is an independent oversight body, that we could respectfully handle classified information, take very seriously our obligations that came with our security clearances, and dig in and ask questions. And I think that we were playing a role. The intelligence agencies you know, wanted to be able to rely on, OK, tell, tell us what to do. Tell us what you're finding. What are the rules so we can find, follow them? So that after we came out of those initial reports, I felt that there was at least the beginning of a relationship where the intelligence agencies would want to get the opinion of this oversight body. In some cases, we are worried they're just, you know, let's not let them just come here for a good housekeeping seal of approval and move on. We want to make sure that this is still a digging in. But I think we're very conscious of trying to establish what are those lines, uh, relationships of trust, that we can all do our work and take our responsibilities seriously. Let's go to the other side and then work away towards the middle. Hi, thank you. Hi, Carrie Cordero, Center for New American Security. Um, my question wants to follow up on the discussion, Sharon, that you were having um, in particular about congressional intelligence oversight. Um, so I share the concern about the difficult, the gap between what the committees of expertise know versus what uh, the rest of the membership does, particularly when it comes down to a specific piece of legislation that then the rest of Congress is asked to vote on. And so what happens is we sort of run up until the deadline um, and, and then many members really are not in a good position to make an informed uh, decision on how they want to vote on something. So um, with respect to the issue of how uh, the difficulty with the clearances on the staff members, that's sort of one discrete solution. Um, is your sense, I'm trying to understand where the resistance is. So is your sense that it is actually the intel committees that are resisting the other members being more informed because they're trying to hold that traditional decades long uh, role that they have where they are the proxies, which is the way the whole system is set up? Or sort of do you have a sense as to where the points of resistance are that are preventing the other members of Congress from being better informed? So I think that's certainly part of it with the Intel committees wanting to preserve their turf. Um, you know, we experienced this where when we were, the particular programs we were looking at were under FISA. So there's also um, officially the primary committee of jurisdiction for FISA is the judici are the judiciary committees. And, but the judiciary committees each only have a small handful of fully cleared staff. Most of the staff of the judiciary committees are not cleared. And they were not as well informed. Um, and they were not as, had so much work to do. And as we moved forward, um, on PCLOB with other activities that we were looking at where there were, there were a lot of questions raised over the extent to which the intelligence committees would be upset if we tried to brief the judiciary committee. So turf is definitely a part of it and that's where you have another committee that clearly has a claim to jurisdiction, never mind moving out to members of Congress that aren't even on judiciary committee. Um, the clearance issue, I'm honestly not totally sure where that is coming from or where the, um, you know, or, or who has even tried to push on that um, to try and fix that. But the other thing I think could be a, more helpful, and we've started to see some movement um, in this direction that's helpful, but I, I would like to see more, is 
where that line is between what's classified and what can be public, and making sure that you know the rules, obviously the statutes, what the authorization should be public, the parameters, sources, and methods, needs remain classified, but there's 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 a mushy area in the middle there, and that we could have a greater understanding um, and a greater effort to have more transparency, so that you could have those conversations more with other members would be another uh, another way I think to help. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Adam Zagger and I'm with the Project on Government Oversight. Um, to anybody who wants to try and answer, um, <coughs> someone earlier cited the example uh, involving the um, <coughs> Senate Intelligence Committee and the efforts that were made to keep track of what they were up to uh, with respect to the uh, torture report some years ago. Um, how many other examples are are there or is anyone aware of of um, elements within the uh, IC community uh, keeping track of Congress in other contexts and, al and also uh, keeping track of their own IGs? Um, because uh, obviously an independent IG, uh, ha the reason IGs are independent um, among them reasons is that uh, they may have interests in particular cases which do not coincide with the uh, interests of the agencies that they are overseeing. And so uh, a, a case recently came to my attention where uh, it appeared that they were uh, keeping track of their own IGs and their own IGs uh, communications with Congress. Um, I mean, is this an issue? Is this a problem? Uh, what do we think about this? Or is it, you know, what do we think about it? Thank you. I, I, I can't speak to that. <laughs> I, I'm not aware of any, I mean, the, the CIA, uh, uh, Sissy example is a very public example of a clash, but I can't speak to anything. I also, I, I've got nothing for you. <laughs> We've discovered apparently a lovely topic for an unwritten research <laughs> report. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Kim Satter, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I had a question that was sort of uh, attached to Jack's question about the NDAs. Um, in the past, the NDAs have been about primarily about the use of the equipment, um, uh, but then there's also the issue of the proprietary technology itself. And one of the problems that we've had, particularly with the Stingrays, is that we don't actually know what they're capable of doing. Um, and so I'm wondering if there is any kind of effort, or have you heard of any kind of effort, to look at doing something like privacy assessment impacts of the technologies that are being used for surveillance. I mean, we have <laughs> privacy assessments that the uh, um, uh, federal government has to do when it's uh, developing a new data collection or whatever. Um, a lot of these uh, surveillance technologies are coming from the federal government, or they're coming from military initially, then they come down to the federal government. In the case of Florida, they had the stingrays that were being used by local sheriffs, but they were actually loaned to them by the federal marshals. And so I'm wondering if there's any kind of effort that could actually get us more information about, or even just oversight, if, uh, I mean, obviously their reason for not uh, disclosing the technology is that they don't want criminals to figure out ways to circumvent the technologies. But is there any way of getting some kind of oversight that actually determines what the technologies are, capability, are capable of, and also setting a standard for what they shouldn't be capable of? Um, so so that, that's a great question. And at the federal level, there are a lot of privacy impact assessments that are done with surveil including for surveillance technologies that are going to gather up private information and putting that out there. And I think it goes to the same question of where we draw that line, right, of certain aspects of exactly how they operate their proprietary information for how they, how they gather that information is one thing, but what are they sucking up 
it should be hopefully on the other side of the line so that we know that and the public um, can assess that and we can assess, you know, do the privacy impact assessment. So I, I, I like that idea. I'm not sure at the local level, uh, honestly, my I work know, doesn't I, go there so much, um, whether there are parallels on these uh, pr parallel privacy impact assessments. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, that's, that's very important um, to do. And, and, and part of the, the CCOPS um, laws, uh, a, a component of the CCOPS laws is to do a, you know, an assessment on, on how it's going to be affecting the, the population that the technology is going to be used on. And so I think in there, there will be some sort of um, assessment. And there's also um, something uh, b before a police department can use the technology or continue to use the technology, they have to reveal um, how they're going to be sharing the data they're collecting and how long they're going to be holding it and whether the, whether it's going to be shared with a fusion center and all of those things are part of the report that they have to then um, go through the city council to get approval for. So maybe in that way it can provide some extra protections. We, we discussed before um, what might be reasonable um, or consensus uh, concepts of uh, measures to be included along with federal funding. Um, do you guys think that something along the lines of that type of um, assessment in conjunction with federal funding for new technologies would be feasible and helpful? I, I think it would be helpful. I was just going to say to your to your point, um, there is oversight being conducted over stingrays, and I, well, I'm not sure if there will be an appetite in this next Congress, but in the last Congress, it was led by uh, Congressman Jim Jordan, um, and he was particularly concerned with the usage of stingrays by the IRS. Um, and there have been a series of hearings uh, on that in the Oversight Committee. Um, whether or not that will continue on in this new Congress, I am not sure. I'm sorry, that sidetracked my question. <laughs> uh, it's over here. Scott from me, Representative Love's office just had some questions about these DHS grants. Uh, what was the purpose of the grants? What was the rationale behind them? I, I'm not familiar with them. And then I'd also like to know, do they get any data back from this or do they have any ties back to the agency that they then get that information from, back from that? Yeah. So I, I alluded to this, as I, I confess this is from work a couple of jobs, <laughs> a couple of a number of years ago. So I'm not sure how you know current my information. But these were a lot of grants that were put out generally in the aftermath of 9/11 to help communities um, secure themselves, and they were available for a variety of purposes. But one very popular purpose was for public video surveillance cameras, um, and I don't have, sorry, at the forefront of my brain at this point because it's been in quite a number of years to recall what the program was necessarily called. They weren't limited to that, but that was a, a very popular purpose. And then after several years of putting them out there, they did actually require um, as one, one string that was attached that they had to implement a privacy policy, uh, adopt a public pro privacy policy if they were going to use it for that purpose. I'm sorry, I don't remember the details at this point. And, um, so Sort of related to that is, you know, I will say like for, for other surveillance technologies, for example, for surveillance um, light bulbs, which is a technology that we're very concerned about, um, which are uh, energy efficient LED, LED light bulbs um, to be used for street lamps, which sounds really good, except that they also have cameras and the ability to record audio. And so they're really just surveillance uh, bulbs um, that, um, we know that agencies like ICE and DEA have been um, pushing those out and trying to get local uh, jurisdictions to um, put those out on their streets um, as a way to further the president's anti-immigrant agenda, um, for example. So we know, you know, sometimes when federal agencies are are making these deals and trying to get the technology into the hands of police departments is because they're trying to further um, the, the executive's agenda, um, that the, both on a national and on a local scale. I think we have time for uh, one, maybe two more questions. 
All right, not seeing anyone. Um, I will um, ask what hopefully we can end on an optimistic note. Um, <laughs> I, so I, I think it's not controversial to say we um, are currently here in DC in a especially um, divisive and partisan time for our government and one that I expect, you know, most people would probably expect that will lead to very little getting done in terms of actual law and policy through Congress. Um, what are areas do you think in this space that could be the exception to that where we might be able to actually get consensus and bridge partisan divides? Well, oversight um, does not have to be and hopefully will should not be um, a partisan activity. Um, oversight is critically important in all um, political times to just have, you know, eyes on independent assessment uh, to make sure that we're um, complying with the rules. The other thing I'll say in that space is um, oversight in many contexts is not limited to just are the um, agencies complying with the law, but also are the rules what they should be? So that was one, I think, very important role for the PCLOB. It was not just looking at legal compliance, but also making recommendations on should these be the rules? Should we have um, different rules in place to better protect privacy and civil liberties? It's also a role Congress can play. Not only you know, are they complying uh, with the rules that we've set out, but do, should we change the rules that are in place? It's a little different from the IGs, which also play, obviously, a very critical role. But the IGs are really looking at strictly at compliance and not at this policy, what should happen. But um, oversight. Um, doesn't have to be political and hopefully uh, won't be overly politicized in all realms and can be robust. Uh, I'd say that there seems to be a trend um, of bipartisan interest in uh, consumer data privacy um, that uh, will definitely continue on um, through this next Congress. Um, and the interest is not limited to one party or the other. Um, so I would say that there are probably that we have not seen the last of um, tech giants coming before the Hill. And our hope at Tech Congress is that as technical expertise continues to improve on Capitol Hill, that Congress will be better equipped to conduct oversight over these um, uh, sometimes bad players. Um, and I echo everything that's been said. I think um, you know uh, everyone is worried about their privacy. Um, being protected, so that's not really a, a partisan issue, and and that's th those are the you know the risk to privacy, the risk to your uh, First Amendment rights. Those are things that everyone cares about. Um, so I think in that way, you know, oversight again is is not a partisan issue, uh, and and it's also about spending, and and I, and I think that um, you know both parties care about where money is being spent and how it's being spent, and so knowing that information is something that I think um, is also a, a bipartisan issue, or yeah. Great. Well, well um, I don't know if the stables would, but knock on wood that that uh, consensus you know <laughs> idea is one that carries through to Congress um, in the next couple of years. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, especially Sharon, who organized this panel, for a uh, great discussion, um, as well as uh, my colleague in the back there, Justin, who is overseeing organizing this entire fantastic event. Um, and I hope you guys will be here the entire day to check out all the great um, panels we have. And thank you all for coming.